is everybody ready? Well then, first I'd like to thank everybody for being here, our judges for judging, um, our video recorder person for recording this, uh, my opponent for being so excellent, and uh, just this entire season will be great. And our opponents for making this not possible and providing for our show will be an excellent debate. Uh, with that, basically, um, brief off time roadmap, we just have three advantages, so it's pretty straightforward. So this resolution asks, should the United States federal government approve the Keystone XL pipeline and our plan text is basically just that, the United States federal government should approve the Trans Canada, the company that's going to build the pipeline with its current proposition to build the Keystone XL pipeline. Our timeline would be on um, January 1st, 2013, and it seems there's not very much to specify. Oh, and our weighing mechanism would be the benefits to the United States. Um, are there any questions on our framework that are at the end? All right, with that, I'll just move on to our advantages, etc. So basically, our first advantage is it would reduce dependency of the United States on the OPEC nations, which are currently the top exporter of oil, so they're a uniqueness. Um, the OPEC nations are currently the largest exporter of oil to the United States. They constitute 41.7% of the oil that the United States currently imports, which represents a plurality of any other group that would um, export oil to the United States. Canada is only 23.6%. It would be better if we could increase that amount of oil, simply because um, these nations often are not favored towards the United States. And if we receive more oil from Canada, which we would by building this pipeline, uh, which is the link, we would now receive more oil from Canada, then the impacts, which is C impact, um, would be A, environmental impacts, because Canada has more regulations on their oil than these other OPEC nations do. For example, um, Saudi Arabia, other nations in that region often dump oil into um, the Red Sea, etc. They don't have the strict regulations that Canada has. Canada um, has imposed many different types of regulations to stop environmental harms. And so if we were to connect the Keystone Pipeline from the current pipeline in Canada to the United States, then we would have transporting oil from the United States to Canada and more regulations and reduced dependency from oil applications. Um, our other environmental advantage is that pipelines are safer transportation than from OPEC nations. So oil spills are much less common from the pipelines um, because there's just less spill when it's traveling through a pipeline than when it's traveling on a boat overseas, for example, from Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, Venezuela, etc. If we were to continue to get oil from these nations, then um, it's just often more oil spills, which cause, of course, a whole slew of environmental problems, which lead to uh, people dying, climate change, etc. Um, so, and then our other impact coming off of reducing dependency on OPEC nations is national security. So basically, a lot of the OPEC nations aren't so friendly with the United States. Um, in 1973, for example, we had the oil embargo, and that if that were to happen again, if we were to have other types of tensions with these OPEC nations, whether it be over Israel or whatever, um, they could cut off our oil supply again, which of course would be detrimental to the United States. Um, this would harm our national security because of course we need all of the oil that we're getting from OPEC nations to run our military, etc. So if we were to increase the amount of oil we got from Canada, this would be better because Canada is on better terms with the United States. We haven't really had a problem with Canada ever, or at least for a very, very long time, and so Canada really has no reason to cut off the oil supply with the United States. So if we increase the amount of oil that we're importing from Canada, we would reduce the amount of oil that we're importing from OPEC nations and other nations that are not so friendly with the United States, which would be net beneficial because of the environment and national security advantages. Um, our second advantage is it would reduce oil prices currently. So our uniqueness is right now, and the status quo, the oil that we get from Canada is less expensive because we have NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which basically says we don't have any types of protective tariffs, etc., between the United States and Canada and Mexico. But basically, since we don't have taxes, this means that the oil is less expensive than the oil that would be coming from the OPEC nations, since we do not have free trade agreements with these nations. And so this would reduce the price of oil if we were to increase the amount of oil that we were importing from Canada, a NAFTA nation. Um, the link, basically, we just get cheap oil because, of course, Keystone Pipeline, more oil in Canada. Um, our sub point C is the impact, which is just increase the quality of life for Americans because the price of consumer goods would drop as a whole. Basically, a lot of people don't realize how important oil is for every aspect of our economy. Um, manufacturing, etc., factories, basically all consumer goods are based on oil. It's not just, you know, our cars that are running on this oil. It's everything in American life is really based fundamentally on oil. So if we can reduce the price of oil, this reduces the price of all consumer goods, which increases quality of life in America and would basically affect our entire economy. If we can reduce the price of oil, the United States economy would get better. And so there's the impact. Our advantage three is uh, jobs. So basically, on the uniqueness, the United States currently has an 8.2% unemployment rate, and that, of course, we would like to reduce. And so our sub-point B is... Um, 
basically more jobs would come out of uh, construction maintenance, that's the link, because we would have to build the Keystone Pipeline, and after we build the pipeline, it would continue to um, need maintenance, etc. Um, according to a New York Times article, this could potentially create 100,000 jobs, which would, of course, be extremely helpful for the United States as a whole, simply because so many Americans are jobless right now, and our economy, of course, we hit the recession, and we're still coming back from the recession, and so if we were to build the Keystone Pipeline, this would just help create more jobs as a whole. I'll accept your first question at this time. Are you mostly jobs will go to the Keystone company, so actually new people wouldn't be getting jobs, it would just be the same people doing their same jobs? Not necessarily, because if we're actually constructing more things, obviously the currently employed Keystone employees have jobs that they're doing right now, and so we're going to need more people for construction, etc. Obviously, they're not just going to be the same people. I don't know what current Keystone employees do, I mean, they're probably people, you know, who work in the government, etc., but they're not the actual construction people. The people of maintenance of the pipeline, obviously there is no maintenance of the pipeline, because the Keystone XL pipeline currently does not exist, and so the manufacturing of this pipeline would basically just uh, create more jobs in the United States. And after it's built, we'll have to continue maintenance, etc., so there would be continued jobs in the United States as a result of this pipeline. Um, the impact is we'll have jobs for the jobless, which would lead to a higher quality of life. This basically ties into our second contention. If we improve the economy in the United States, it would just create a better situation overall in the United States um, that would just improve quality of life and uh, make things better. And so um, the last thing that I kind of want to talk about is, I, I'm not really sure, it's not really a contention, but um, there, the Keystone Pipeline in Canada has already been built, so there's already um, a piece of the pipeline that exists in Canada, and so um, if they try to bring up any environmental disadvantages about how, you know, using oil sands is bad, etc., the Keystone Pipeline already exists. It's the XL extension that we would be building. So if they're going to come up here and tell you they would be bad for the environment, um, etc., if we're going to be getting oil from oil sands, that oil is already going to be coming out of the oil sands, and Canada is already going to be producing this oil because they already have the Keystone Pipeline in Canada. The only difference is if we don't build the XL extension, that oil is not going to be coming to the United States, but instead it's going to be going to other nations that have this demand for oil, because Canada, of course, can sell its oil to any other nation, you know, and those nations could be nations that we don't necessarily want this oil to be going to. Perhaps it's better for this oil to be coming to the United States rather than China, etc. And so for all of these reasons, I strongly urge a vote in favor of the affirmation today. Thank you. I'm going to be uh, going over their plan and then the dissatisfaction and getting the counter plan will solve the dissatisfaction. So, uh, just for future reference, you don't have to tell me like, what the off case is going to be. I just oh. need to know how many sheets of paper. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, oh, I'm going to do this guy. Alright, um, then dissatisfaction and then counter plan. Yes, yeah. Counter plan. So two sheets? Yeah. What's the word? Okay, you don't have to say what you're doing. Just... Okay, it's not too good. On November 29th, 2000. Oh, wait, are you guys ready? <laughs> On November 29, 2011, in an article in the New York Times, Mark Whitman wrote that profits before environment, in, in an article entitled Profits Before Environment, he wrote that if the Keystone Pipeline is built, we're going to see a rising production of greenhouse gas emissions because tar sands produce three times as many greenhouse gases as conventional fuel. It's because of this that we're going to propose counter plan today. It's going to be solving for the, uh, specifically for the dissatisfaction of their plan, and gonna, uh, it's going to help America more in the long term. But first, let's look at their plan today. Their plan today is the United States federal government should approve the Trans-Canada Pipeline by January 1st, 2013. First of all, let's look at their solvency. We're not going to actually see that this plan is going to be approved. I'm giving you a link about how exactly uh, the Keystone Pipeline is going to be approved in the first place. Because first of all, we have to realize that even if Congress approves it, Obama's going to veto it because Obama has publicly expressed that he doesn't want the Excel Pipeline like how it is right now, the proposition. And since they haven't changed anything about how the Keystone Pipeline is right now, then Obama's not going to approve it. So you can't vote on it because by t in January 1st, 2013, Obama's still going to be in office. So there's no solvency uh, on that either. It's and secondly, for funding, they haven't pro proposed any like funding at all and talked about it or talked about it at all. And they're talking about these impacts of the Keystone XL pipeline without actually like giving us a proper funding. So I'd like you guys to take those into consideration and uh, take care take care of one. Uh, with Trans Canada, the company that's building the pipeline, fund the pipeline. Yeah, we just wanted like you know a number, but yeah, I guess that should work. But then let's look at the, let's look at their contention today. First of all, they're saying that it's going to reduce their dependency from OPEC nations. First of all, we're still going to be reduced on it, but our counter plan, we're going to eliminate or uh, do far more reducing dependency from OPEC nations. And I'll, brush, I'll go over that in my counter plan. But secondly, uh, their second their sub point on that was that the environment that 
building this pipeline, it's going to be more common than oil spills. Like, uh, oil, oil, if we like import more oil, there's going to be more oil spills. But what they fail to realize is that oil spills in the oceans are far more, da- or far more, far less devastating than oil spills that will come from the Keystone XL pipeline. If like oil is being spilled on a ship that's like coming from uh, Bahrain to the United States, it's not going to be as devastating as like the pipeline burst in uh, like Nebraska or something, because then it's going to be destroying American food and American crops, and that's going to be far more devastating because. If they build a pipeline, there's a chance of it. Uh, uh, if there's a chance of it bursting, and the oil that's spilled from that's going to actually be directly correlated to rising food prices for Americans, and like the, our agriculture is going to be devastated by that. I'll take it for you a while. Don't you, all, but don't you also have to take into consideration the issues of probability when compared to the two? Yeah, that's what we're saying. Like the pro- okay, maybe the probability of an oil spill is uh, oil spill in the ocean, like by a ship, is higher than the probability of a pipeline. But the magnitude of devastation from a uh, pipeline burst in the heartland is far higher than an oil spill in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's the thing because a, an oil spill in the middle of the Pacific Ocean isn't going to hurt America as much as an oil spill in like in Nebraska because in Nebraska that's like the heartland where all our food is produced. And if food prices go up from these devastating tar sand spills, then we're going to see a spike in food, uh, spike in the cost of food, and that's going to uh, dis- or disadvantage Americans even further. Their second contention is that there's going to be reduced cost in oil, but in fact the Associated Press did a report and they found out that the Keystone it wouldn't in fact actually substantially reduce the prices of oil. They're proposing this plan that's going to like hurt the environment in America that's uh, a lot, but ultimately it's not going to actually be like you know reducing the price of oil by like half or anything. It's going to be if it does, it's going to be a minimal amount. So like the risk of uh, damage outweighs like the small benefit that Americans will get from like one or two cents being reduced in their price of, uh, price for a gallon of oil. And their third advantage was that it's going to be jobs. And they said they're going to create 100,000 jobs. But it's not actually going to be 100,000 jobs. Because most of these are, first of all, going to be temporary for the construction of the pipeline. Once the pipeline is constructed, the amount of people employed is going to dramatically reduce. And, sec- and it's been estimated that there's only going to be 5,000 permanent jobs. So they can't tie into impacts of 100,000 people being less uh, being employed because only 5,000 are going to be employed in the long run. So that, you can't buy their jobs point, but in our plan, you're going to be able to buy it. So the counter plan today is this. The United States federal government will take all of their money and it, that they're using and invest it into solar energy. And basically, we're going to be solving their dissides. First, it's engulf in, in all of their dissides. First, they're going to say they're going to reduce dependency from OPEC nations. We're going to be reducing it even better because we're not going to, first of all, if we build the tar sand stuff, we're still going to be uh, getting oil from OPEC nations. We're not like completely reducing that. But by solar power and helping out, like, you know, uh, stopping burning like uh, tar sands, reduce electricity, then we're going to be importing far less than they're going to be importing. And that, that way, we're, we can tie into far, far more impacts than them because, first of all, uh, we're not going to be uh, as dependent on OPEC nations. I'll take one for you. Uh, what's the status of your plan? Is it conditional? Uh, no, it's not conditional. We're like the money. You're, if uh, you're saying you're going to approve the Keystone XL pipeline, we're saying we're not going to approve it, and we're just going to uh, the the funding is going to come from the Department of Energy, and we're going to invest in solar energy to power America. So like uh, the time, as we said, the funding time frame is pretty much the same as theirs. And so first of all, that was the first advantage. And the environment, they're saying uh, we're actually going to be solving for the harms that are coming to the environment because first of all, we're we're not going to be importing tar sands because tar sands when you burn them, they emit three times as many as normal greenhouse gases. We're not going to be emitting these, uh, emitting these gases. Instead, we're going to be relying on renewable sources of energy that don't emit any uh, harmful gases. So we're going to be solving for the environment even better than them. So the second was reduced cost. We're going to have an even farther reduced cost because we're going to be importing the soil and more of the solar power. Because solar power is pretty, it's like, honestly, it's cheap. It's free because it's coming from the sun. We're not, it's not going to be like that much money at all. And basically, uh, we're solving for that. And third is jobs, is that we're going to have jobs too for solar power. And it's going to be, uh, uh, more jobs because we're investing in it for uh, instead of just building a pipeline, we're investing in it. There's going to be more jobs for like production, for like research, things like that. And basically, the advantages for us today is that first of all, we're going to actually be um, improving the environment. They're not really like impacting the environment, but we're going to impact the environment. This environment is really crucial. First of all, they're really harming the United States environment because it's going right through our major like food area. Our solar power, we're going to be helping the environment and that's going to be beneficial because like uh, we can't exist without the environment. It's like pretty straightforward. And our se- that was our first advantage. Our second advantage is that it's going to increase American solar power. Currently, China leads the world in solar power like uh, distribution and like use of uh, like dramatic increases in renewable energy. And the problem with this is that we, the United States, the world's most powerful country, aren't investing and buckling down on green energy. It's going to be like China's doing this and like we're not. And that's going to reduce solar power because people are going to realize like the United States isn't like the future isn't being made in the United States. Instead, we're relying on old methods to tarnish the environment. So that's bad news to reduce trade, things like that. So we can't actually like 
uh, past their plan because our plan solves it better. We're, their plan is going to be hurting uh, American stock power and global image, where ours actually helps it out. And uh, secondly, nine out of ten Ameri- or thirdly, nine out of ten Americans favor solar energy, and because of that percentage, we can see that government is a tool for the people, and we have to allow this to pass because. Well, what the people want, we have to allow it to pass. The people want renewable energy, so that has to pass. And we can clearly see that because our plan solves for all the disadvantages and uh, does more than their plan in terms of benefits, you have to vote negation today. Thank you. So, quick break off time for now. I'll start by going over um, the counter plan, then I'll go on to neg responses to the F case. Um, yeah. So, with that, I'll begin. So, let's take a second and look at the counter plan that's been brought up, which the plan text was something along the lines of take all the money that we'd be putting into the Keystone project and instead put it into solar power. Now, there's a major issue with the solvency of this counter plan is the fact that the United States federal government, the actor that they're going to take all the money that would be put into the Keystone pipeline and put it into solar power, the United States federal government is not actually spending anything on the Keystone uh, XL pipeline because the company TransCanada is the one that is actually doing this. So they're taking money from the company, according to their, the, their plan text, they're taking the money from TransCanada. They're actually taking money from TransCanada that the United States federal government doesn't own and then putting it into solar power which has a couple of issues. So one, they can't do that. They can't take money from TransCanada. But, um, so that's the issue. Also, they said that the counter plan is unconditional, so they're stuck into this advocacy of having this counter plan where they take the money that we would be spending on Keystone XL and instead put it into uh, solar power. So they're trapped into that advocacy, but essentially they can't take the money because it's TransCanada's money, not the United States federal government's money. They have no solvency because they can't actually put it into solar power. The other issue is the fact that they have actually, uh, like no specification on what their plan text is going to do. So they talk about taking this money and putting it into solar power, but what are they actually doing? Are they subsidizing solar energy companies? Are they, is the United States federal government actually doing the research on its own through the public sector? It's not clear, and so because they don't specify, we're just putting into money into, well, we don't know what we're putting money into. So those are the two major issues on their plan. And so um, before I go into their advantages, I just want to say one more thing. In the event that they... Uh, that ultimately we, we can still, the affirmative team can still confirm their counter plan. We can do our plan and the negative counter plan if they change it from taking the money from TransCanada and just have the U.S. government deficit spend or something like that. We can do it too. We can also put, all, put the, money, the same amount of money into solar power so we get all of their advantages. Um, and yeah, basically. So, but right now in their current plan text where they're just taking money from Keystone XL pipeline, they cannot do that. They can't solve. And for these reasons, you can't vote for the counter plan. You can't vote for the opposition team. The, uh, Going on to their advantages, they first talk about the fact that tar sands are bad. And so there's a couple issues with this. Now, obviously, greenhouse gases in general are bad, but when they're blowing out of proportion the impact that tar sands have. Tar sands actually only produce about 0.1% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. So we're not looking at a substantial amount when we're doing this. And so the impacts that we talked about, that Christina brought up in her first speech, outweigh the fact that we're increasing the uh, current greenhouse gas emissions by like 0.1% because it's not a substantial amount of tar sands that we're moving. I'll take your first point of information. So if you like import more tar sands to the United States, which like produces the most energy, aren't you going to be substantially increasing, increasing the emissions of like, greenhouse gas from tar sands? Not necessarily because it's not like we're taking like two times as much oil out of these tar sands than we're already importing. Like this isn't a, this isn't a gigantic amount of oil. Now it's enough to create jobs and to reduce prices, as you said, a little bit. But the major issue, but the, the issue at hand is that we're not going to be substantially increasing the current percentage of greenhouse gases coming from oil sands because there aren't a whole lot of oil sands in the world. So we're, the, and plus, these oil sands are already actually being refined. Like, Canada's already doing, getting the oil from the oil sands in the first place because, as we said, the Keystone Pipeline already exists and they're already extracting the oil from the, oil, the tar sands in the status quo. So all we're doing is getting, taking that stuff that's already been taken out and using it in the United States. So it would have been used either way. Uh, moving on to the second advantage, increasing soft power. Uh, basically, we don't actually, I don't understand how uniquely we increase soft power through, um, through solar power, but, in the, but they, don't get the, they don't get this advantage because they don't have solvency, but if they do get this advantage, we can just permit to the uh, affirmative case if they change their context. And then their third advantage is nine out of 10 Americans prefer solar power. Um, 
So I'm not exactly sure what the impact is on this this point, so um, I don't know how to respond to it because it doesn't seem to have an impact attached to it. I'll take a second point from If you guys want to affirm the plan, you're saying that you'll get the soft power, but you're advocating for oil, which hurts the environment, and solar power. So there's so they're like competing advocacies there. So how would you be gaining the well, soft we can, power impact? We can. I mean, I don't entirely understand. We have our own. Um, we have our own international diplomacy advantage, uh, impact that we list in our case. But if if your impact is uniquely increasing soft power through the creation of solar power, if we perm that and increase our solar power without really substantially increase, because we're not exact, we're not increasing the consumption of oil by getting oil from car sands in Canada. Instead, we're just increasing the amount of oil we get from Canada, not OPEC. It's not like we're getting more oil all of a sudden. We're just getting less from other places, more from Canada. That's the impact. So we're not actually doing it. We're not actually increasing our oil usage like we're claiming that we are, so we can still access your second advantage of the current plan. Um, but that's really all I have to say on the counter plan. Ultimately, they don't have solvency because they're trying to take money from the corporation. So, again, in response to our plan, the first thing that they brought up is that we don't have solvency because Obama's not going to sign, which is not what we're here to debate about today. So, the affirmative team is just going to fee off the passage of our plan and sign it by Obama, so that's not what we're talking about. Um, and again, Keystone, uh, TransCanada, the company, is going to be building this pipeline, not the United States. We're just authorizing its construction so it can be constructed. So moving on to the case, basically our first advantage is that we decrease dependence on OPEC, and we have a couple of impacts coming off of this. So the first impact that we talk about is the environmental impact, which is really important. And so they drop the fact that Canada has more regulation on um, has more regulation on environmental th uh, things than these foreign countries do with the OPEC nations. So you see a significantly le lower amount of oil spills in Canada than you do from the Arab nations, from the OPEC nations. So by relying on Canada more, we actually do have safer um, treatment of the oil and basically the environmental impacts that they outline will actually be media uh, mitigated because we're going through Canada and not OPEC. They talk about land spills being worse and food prices going up, and so there's a couple issues with that. Land spills are significantly easier to maintain than ocean spills because the oil is going to be in the water. It's a lot harder to stop. You guys, we all remember what happened in the, uh, the, per uh, the Gulf of Mexico with that oil spill. So the issue is, is that land spills are actually easier to deal with than oil spills. And they also talk about uh, ocean. And also, they're a lot less probable. We're not going to have these pipeline spills because, as Christina pointed out in her first speech, pipeline is so much safer than putting it onto a boat in the first place. Um, and so they talk about food prices going up. That's not going to happen because it's so improbable. But also the United States is such a surplus of food that we're not going to get a significant increase in the price of food coming from an oil spill that might destroy a couple acres of crop land. Um, going forward, the national security still is there. If the United States, in the event that OPEC enacts an embargo on the United States, we would not have the necessary capabilities to... Um, implement our military, so it's a huge national security threat if we get more oil from Canada, decrease dependence on them, and so yeah, with that we're just going to move on. So basically our second point is that uh, cheaper oil, they said it wouldn't reduce the price substantially, but a couple of cents, 10 cents even, across the board is a huge amount of money when you count, consider the fact that all these companies and all these individuals are using it, so that advantage still stands, and they, they say it's not that big of a deal, but it's still a big deal. And um, on the third one, they say it's not actually 10, 100,000 jobs, it's only temporary, but the issue is, is that 100,000 jobs will help with our recovery. So even if it's only temporary, it will help us stimulate the economy and help lead us towards our recovery. And so for these reasons, I urge you to go in favor of the affirmation. First, you know, they talk about like some problems with the counter plan about how like perming and they talk oh, about gotcha, how like gotcha. so I think I'm gonna try to clear that up first. So deal with the, the theory on the counter plan first and then go to case and then you go to the advantages of the counter plan? I, I think, yeah, that's oh. not pretty, pretty, pretty okay. Make sure you let me know where you are. Okay. <coughs> Alright. So first of all, my partner said that we clarified after like I do admit at first he did say we're gonna take this from the U.S. government, but after that, he, and you guys said we're going to take from Canada, Trans-Canada Oil, but he, he did clarify after that we're going to get this money from the Department of Energy, and then you guys said we could we could perm the plan, but even if you do that, you're not going to be gaining all our, our, oh yes, 
Wait, so just to clarify, we're just going to take money from the Department of Energy and just spend it? Do you give any, like, like how much we're getting, like, um, where we're going to get, raise the funding, et cetera, like, specification on your plan? You guys didn't give too much specification about funding either, so I don't think if, if we didn't have specific numbers, they didn't give specific numbers, we shouldn't be entitled to give the same specific numbers as well. So going to that, we're going to say that this plan can't be permed because if you're looking at this, they're not even going to be gaining access to all our advantages. While they're promoting for oil and stuff that destroys the environment, oil, which we use, we're promoting for solar power, alternative energy. Those two are like competing, like competing things. Like they're just like almost exact opposites. They both do things, but one of them significantly hurts the environment, and the other one doesn't. So I think because of that, you can't really firm it. And one of our main advantages was soft power, so they won't even be really getting access to that, and they won't even get access to environment because they're still they're still having the oil the oil problem from there. So they're, even if they're firming our CP, our two major advantages, they won't be getting access to, to that. Did you have a point? Okay, sorry. Okay, so now going into their case. So their first, their first contention is their first contention was we're going to be getting uh, less, less OPAC oil. But this is also like non-unique. We can do a lot of plans to get less OPAC, OPAC oil. We can also investing in our plan. We can move towards less OPAC oil in the future because even with their plan, it's going to take years to build the Keystone pipeline. So we won't see us getting less OPEC oil for a while. And you can see the same thing with our plan. If we invest a significant amount into the solar energy, we can see that we'll be relying on that more. And we can also get less OPEC oil in, in, the, in the future. And they're, still, and they're still conceiving about the spill. They're still saying it can exist and it can get on U.S. soil. So there still would be a small, there still would be a disadvantage coming from this, even if it does spill in the U.S. They're still conceding that it can happen. When you have it happen in Green Life, they could, even if a few people get disrupted by the farms and stuff, that's still a big deal to those thousands of people who live in Nebraska and the farmland. That's one of the main reasons President Obama didn't pass it anyway, because even if it doesn't spill, it disrupts many of the farms going through the Midwest. It gets in the way of many farms. People have to move their farms and space has to be cleared. So that's also going to cost money too. They talk about they talk about their second contention was it reduces oil prices. But my partner came up and said it's only going to reduce it by by a couple of cents. And they actually conceded to this, but they said it's going to be a big impact. So let's actually look at it. If it gets reduced by five ten cents ten cents on the gallon, you could say maybe a tank you'll save a dollar or so on a tank. And if you fill up two times a month, I mean, you're going to be saving twenty twenty five dollars a year. Is that really so much where you're going to be stimulating and spending in the economy? That's really not going to be that much. And in fact, twenty dollars you could just save that. You're not necessarily going to be spending that much in the in the in the environment. I mean, economy. Sorry, they're not showing you how how this money is going to be used in helping out the economy in a in a big way. So you can't buy that point. Going on to the next one, the job. The jobless rate currently is at 8.2%, and they said we're going to have more jobs, potentially 100,000. But that's just what it is. It's potentially 100,000 jobs. And me and my partner came up here and we told you, well, actually, we're only going to have five or 6,000 jobs in construction, and actually, many of these jobs are just going to be taken by the Keystone Pipeline workers them themselves. We'll just keep their same jobs, and like people who are working on getting this passed will simply move into a different department, but still working on this. So many of the jobs already exist, and we're only going to be seeing a few permanent jobs. And after it's finished, like my partner said, we're not going to be seeing so many jobs, and we're actually moving out of the recovery right now, so we don't necessarily need a big big simulation of jobs. And like my partner said, our counter plan, we're investing into solar, we're investing into solar energy research and technology, so you can also see, see jobs coming from our plan too. But the big reason why we're winning today is, is on the environment. They keep, they keep saying that, oh, we're not going to be using more oil. But the way it is today, in the next 30 years, we could see the sea levels go up and rise over and come onto countries like global warming is happening at, at an alarming rate. And, and even at the oil, the amount of oil we use now, even if they say it's going to be consistent with the amount of oil we use now, that's still not going to be helping to solve global warming. Global warming is still ha happening. We're not saying that more oil will, you know, we'll be using more oil so this will hurt the environment than more. Even if we use the amount of oil we do now, that's still going to hurt us and that's still going to lead to global warming and the world will end sooner if you vote for their plan. With our plan, we're looking to use our, we're, we're looking to use solar energy to help wean ourselves off oil. With their plan, you're not weaning yourselves off oil. You're still using the oil. Yes. Did you give any warrants saying that solar power will actually solve all these issues that you're talking about? We didn't. It'll it'll at least help solve the issues it'll it'll talk about. We're taking a step in the right direction. We're taking a step and looking for the long term of the long term future of the United States. While their future is just a short term short term oil thing, we are taking a step to perhaps solving it. With our plan, there's a chance that starting with solar power, then if it works, we can start investing in new 
new technology. We're taking steps in the right direction, which should be commended, whereas they're just taking steps in the same oil, oil production and with the oil we've been using for years, which is what scientists have been saying, if we keep using oil at the same rate, which is what we're doing under their plan, using oil at the same rate as we do now, we will move to global global warming. But uniquely with our plan, we're not going to be, even for a little while, they, they might come up here and say, well, until you get these solar power plants running and more alternative running, you're still using the same amount of oil. Yes, that might be true, but in, the, but in 20, 30 years down the line, we might be using less oil thanks to all our alternative energy. Just to clarify on the counter plan, they don't have any access to our thing because we we said how these competing advocacies of oil and solar panel, so the, the world would not think of this more as soft power because the thing is that we're actually hurting the environment and the same time we're helping it. This is just contradictory, so you're not going to be gaining the advantage that we get off the soft power. Yes? Is the United States currently developing solar power while also using oil? Yes, that may be true, but we look bad for the oil. In our plan specifically, we are going down on the oil. That's what we're saying. In the future, because of more technology, we will decrease our oil consumption. And, and right now, we don't look so good to the world in the environment. So if they're sticking with that, many countries don't see us as very good. China, on the other hand, is investing tons more into solar energy, and people are looking up to China. If we expect the world to change to solve the global warming crisis, we have to be a beacon of, of, of light and shining hope for the world to look at us and say, hey, if the United States can do this and help the environment, then we can do it too, and they'll be, have more incentive to invest because they see the United States doing it. For all those reasons, I strongly urge a negative ballot. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to go over, like, uh, back over the firm counter plan stuff, the theory, and then uh, this adds their plan, uh, our advantages, and then voting issues. So, all right, you all ready? All right. The difference between the plan and the counter plan today is going to make all the difference in why you're going to be voting for the negation today. Specifically, their advocacy is uh, destroying the environment, and our advocacy is aiding the environment. They might come up here and they might like say we can firm all their advantages and take them to our side, but ultimately they can't do that because that'd be a shift in advocacy. Everything they're bringing up is related toward like bringing in more oil from Canada and things like that, so they can't reap in any of the advantages that we're bringing up that are exclusive to our plan and unique to our plan because we're specifically advocating for more solar power while not approving the Keystone XL pipeline, which is tarnishing our image and uh. uh the problem for global warming. First of all, let's go over the environment. Under their, under their plan, they keep on skimming over the damage to the environment they're going to cause. They keep on like saying, you know, it's very un, it's very unlikely. But the problem they don't realize is we'll concede it's a low likelihood that the oil pipeline will burst, but the magnitude is far too high, uh, far too high to ignore. First of all, you have to you have to realize that they come up here and they say like food surplus and things like that. But the problem with that is that if the oil pipeline does burst in like Nebraska, the farmers in the area around it will be devastated. Their their like land will not be usable for uh, food. And say like the oil pipeline uh, like was like leaking and things like that, and that oil got into like the soil, then the crops growing in the soil would be poisonous and be toxic. They haven't addressed the pollution point at all. They keep saying it's too light, uh, unlikely. But the problem with that is the magnitude is too far, and that's gonna uh, the way, the magnitude out, out or excuse me, the magnitude weighs out the likelihood. Thank you. Or, wait, what the heck? Sorry. Your point. Uh, do, you, do you have any evidence saying that the pipeline is going to burst? Any empirics on previous pipelines bursting? Anything that really talks about the ramifications or that this could happen? All right. The problem with this is the pipeline can burst. They come up here and they're saying that we don't have any evidence. They, don't, they, they keep saying that the pipeline isn't going to burst, but they haven't shown you evidence on how or why the pipeline isn't going to burst. So we're, we're not showing you how the pipeline or is going to burst. But the fact of the matter is they keep saying that there is a chance. Is that like uh, the impact uh, that there is a chance, like uh, even though it's small, there is a chance. But basically, uh, the problem with this is that there anything can fail and like, the, anything fail, like the construction of the pipeline, things like that, and ultimately that's going to hurt the American people, and they're not addressing it, so don't let them bring it up in their next speech. Se their second advantage unique to us is soft power. We can see that like China and countries like that are like uh, a, you know going toward more renewable energy, but their plan is specifically tarnishing our image because we're importing the world's dirtiest fuel, Alberta tar sands. That destroys our image as like uh, because like if the thing is like soft power is very key to like America America's involvement abroad because without soft power and like America actually like you know doing the right thing countries won't respect us as much as much and we won't be able to like you know show, like you know uh, other countries won't be following in like 
global warming pre prevention, things like that. So only that's be that uh, benefit is only coming from our side, and there it's a disadvantage on their side. The third is the nine out of ten Americans. They didn't respond to this at all because government legitimacy is very important. We have to realize that if nine out of ten Americans want more investment, then we have to do it because the government is like a tool for the people. They, they keep saying we don't have an impact attached to it. I, we don't like need to spell out every impact. The fact of the matter is that Congress is like a representation of the American people, and nine out of ten Americans. Far more than two thirds want it. We have to. We have to allow solar energy to pass. And basically, that's the difference between uh, uh, their plan and uh, uh, their <coughs> advocacy. Or excuse me, those are the disasters of their plan. And the advantages coming off of our plan is the first of all, as I said, soft power. The impacts off that. Secondly, environment, because we're going to be taking out like solar power. Uh, it's going to be taking out so many like uh, oil barrels out of the American like how much we're consuming. So basically, there's that advantage because the environment, the impact is too far like for me to articulate because like. They, like I can't I can't say it enough because like if we if there is an oil spill or something like that especially because tar sands emit the most the world's dirtiest fuel the problem is that cities like L A there's going to be huge smog problems and people are going to be dying from lung cancer things like that those are huge impacts already two thousand people die from smog in America every year they're like uh increase of like dirty the world's dirtiest fuel is going to kill far more people the impact is far too high to ignore so don't uh, uh vote them down on that. And uh, basically, the, the advantages that we're actually helping out the environment are reducing uh, greenhouse gas emission and our reducing fuel costs, things like that. So basically, our plan is actually helping the environment. Their plan is destroying the environment. We're solving for all the harms they're saying about like 8.2% unemployment, and we're solving it better. And uh, also, we have to realize that in the global, in like the future, we have to lean toward renewable sources because we can't keep importing tar sands and things like that because one, it's hurting soft power, it's not a permanent solution, and it's ultimately going to be harmful toward the American people, and that's why we're very strong uh, for about, or negative about Thank you. Um, I'm just going to basically begin on, I'm going to talk about the counter plan briefly, then I'm going to just kind of talk nebulously, I suppose, about the affirmative advantages and do voting issues kind of along the way there. All right, then. So once again, they really don't have any specification on the counter plan they provide, and they say that they don't need specification because we don't provide specification. However, we do provide specification. We just said that we would do the plan that has currently been proposed by the Trans Canada um, the Trans Canada company that's going to be building the pipeline. We don't need to talk about how much funding the United States federal government, the actor in this resolution, is going to be spending simply because they're not spending any money. They're simply authorizing the Keystone Pipeline to be built, whereas they don't offer any types of specification on what they're doing. They're just saying they're getting the money from the Department of Energy. Well, where's that money coming from? Are they borrowing money from foreign nations? Are we are we going to um, implement some kind of new tax to get this money? They don't have a funding plan. They also don't have a time frame plan. They don't even say what they're going to do. They don't say whether they're going to give subsidies to companies. They don't say whether it's going to be through the private sector, the public sector, what exactly is going to be happening with their plan. And they also don't provide a link between investment and solar success. So basically, they really don't specify anything what they're doing. So I don't really see how you could vote on this counter plan. Um, also, the advantages I have under this counter plan, the first one is about how tar sands are bad. Um, that's one of the net benefits they have. But once again, I preempted this in my first speech. I talked about how there's going to be the tar sands anyway. Canada is still going to be exporting oil from the tar sands. It might just not be to the United States, but still, there's going to be the tar sands. They don't respond to this preempt. Also, this is I'm sorry, I won't have time for questions in this speech. Also, um, they don't respond to the other environmental um, advantages that we talk about. They completely drop the point about how Canada has more regulation than OPEC nations. They don't respond to it during their first speech. They don't respond to it during the block. So once again, kind of the uh, environmental advantages are outweighed. Also, they don't respond to the statistics that my partner provided about how tar sands are only 0.1% of um, greenhouse gases, etc. So they're not even going to be increasing global warming very much. Also, the only thing they talk about is how, you know, there might be a chance that the pipeline could burst. But once again, the likelihood of that is extremely unlikely. Pipelines are the safest form of oil transportation. I mean, there's so many, I don't know, existential threats that could occur in the United States. But, you know, just because aliens could invade and attack us doesn't mean that we need to, you know, preempt aliens. It's extremely, extremely unlikely that we would ever have a pipeline burst. It is much more likely that we would have an oil spill when we're getting oil from OPEC nations. And we need to worry about that, not an oil pipeline bursting. Anyway, our environmental impacts outweigh there. So please don't vote there. Um, also, 
There are other two advantages, increasing salt power. They still don't really provide impacts there, and 9 out of 10 Americans prefer salt power. Once again, no impact. They don't really explain to you why this matters, why this is important around today, how this is actually going to save lives, improve quality of life, or what exactly their counter plan does. And even if you believe that their counter plan does something, once again, there's the perm. They say it's mutually exclusive. However, it's not. We could hypothetically do both. We are currently doing both. And if we're going to develop solar power anyway, we would still need oil to keep our country running while we're developing solar power. Obviously, the two are not mutually exclusive. So even if you buy everything they're saying, um, they're still not mutually exclusive. Perm do both advocacy for the internet. Anyway, I'd like to talk a little bit about now affirmative voting issues in this round. So our advantage one was reduces dependency on OPEC, and we basically had two voting issues coming off of this. The first was the environmental impacts, which I talked a little bit about before when I was um, comparing the cases. But once again, Canada regulation, and it's much safer to have a pipeline than transporting goods across the ocean from OPEC nations. That's the first environmental advantage. And so flow that to us, please, because once again, their tar sands disadvantage occurs um, in the status quo, and it would occur even if we built the Keystone Pipeline. Tar sands are going to happen anyway. Um, our second advantage coming off of our, our second I'm sorry, voting issue coming off of our first advantage is national security, which once again, they don't respond to. I'm sorry, I have a lot of time for questions during this speech. Once again, they do not respond to um, our national security advantage. We talked about the 73 embargo and how that causes problems for the United States military, etc. If the OPEC nations, which are not as friendly to the United States as Canada uh, is, were to cut off oil to the United States, this would be devastating for the United States national security and basically put a huge cripple on our economy as a whole, which leads me to our third voting issue today, which is... Um, oil prices, et cetera, the economy, that kind of all goes together. So basically our second advantage, they, um, reducing oil prices, they try to mitigate it by saying it's only a couple cents. But you know, across the big spectrum, a couple cents difference in oil prices, the difference that would be caused because we have tariffs with OPEC nations but don't have tariffs with Canada because of NAFTA, it would create a huge difference. If it's a large company buying huge amounts of oil to run whatever they're doing, manufacturing, etc., a couple cents makes a huge difference on a large scale. And so basically by reducing those prices, we ultimately reduce the prices of consumer goods. By reducing the prices of consumer goods, we ultimately stimulate the economy as a whole, increase quality of life, and that would just net benefits across um, the United States. Um, basically, that kind of ties into our advantage three, our jobs advantage. Once again, we're recovering from a recession right now. If we increase jobs um, in the long run, it will help the United States. Job increases increase quality of life, even for the short term, even if it's short term employment, we still see increase of quality of life for those people. And once again, it does provide some long term jobs because there's uh, maintenance on the pipeline, etc. And so for all of these reasons, I strongly urge a vote in favor of the affirmation today because simply they really have no solvency on their counter plan because of the lack of specification, etc. Even if they do, you can vote on the perm. We can still do both. And all of the advantages we cite today. Thank you.